Hello, and welcome to episode four of Kickstart My, a crowdfunding podcast. I'm your host, Andrew McDonald. On this episode, I got the chance to speak to Andrew Gildy, creator of Lovecraftian noir horror comic Forgotten Hymns, which as of this interview going live, has 16 days to go and has nearly hit its goal. Andrew informed me of how this story came about. Spawned by a love of horror, this story mixed with modern interpretations of Lovecraftian mythos hopes to bring attention to the horrors of sexual abuse. Inspired by the birth of his daughter and the fears of realizing the world she will grow up in, with the actual real dangers and monsters that walk among us, Forgotten Hymns was born to explore this subject matter. A link to the Kickstarter can be found at the top of this podcast description. And you can find it, of course, by heading to kickstarter.com and searching for Forgotten Hymns. That's H-Y-M-N-S, Forgotten Hymns. And now, on to our interview. Tell us all about Forgotten Hymns. All right, uh, Forgotten Hymns is a hard-boiled Lovecraftian noir um, horror uh, miniseries. It's about a corporate Harris billionaire named Lillian Richmond, who is trying to cover up her father's crimes, but in doing so, she uncovers a deep, dark occult secret that her family's legacy is tied to. Um, so it's a lot of a lot of monsters, a lot of crime, um, a lot of a lot of character-driven drama. It's um, the best thing I could describe it as, it's um, Fatal, um, that was the Ed Brubaker series, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, mixed with Lovecraft's Country, mixed with, um, I don't know, maybe maybe Taken, a okay. little, little, bit of, little bit of everything. Okay. All right, so this is your second creator-owned book? Yeah, this is my second creator on book. The my first book was Man of Sin, uh, which was a um, uh, a horror. It was like the it's what happens if um, a regular normal guy found out he was the Antichrist <laughs> and how and why he would destroy the world. And so, um, pretty much what it was was a guy finds out finds out that his son um, his son's death was a little bit more. Uh, more covered up than what was on the surface. Mm -hmm. And so every step he takes to find what really happened about his son brings him that much further into like madness. And he starts getting some supernatural powers and things aren't what they seem. So um, a lot of, a lot of dark horror stuff. Apparently that's what I write about. Apparently. (laughs) Apparently some of it's inspired by your own children (laughs) from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, so I, I write, um, so as a writer, I, how can I put this? Um, as, as a writer, I think it's your chance when you go to tell a story to tell the world the, how it should work or how it should be. It's your way. It's your chance to say something to the world. And a lot of people do it in a lot of different ways. Um, for me, I like to, um, work in kind of the domestic realm. And what do I mean by that is like family stuff. Um, uh, it really means a lot to me. Um, uh, just working in, in, you know, how to get through kind of deep family stuff. Cause it's something I think is universal that we all deal with. Um, and so my, my first book, Man of Sin dealt with, um, you know, how do you get over, um, losing someone close to you? Like, how do you deal with that? Um, and where Man of Sin came from was I lost both my, both my stepfather and my grandfather to cancer, like six months from each other. And I watched my family grieve and it was, you know, my, not only was it catharsis, you know, being really cathartic for me to write about that stuff, but it was my way to show them how not to deal with tragedy. If that makes sense. And so where Forgotten Hymns comes from, um, once once I, I became a father a little over a year ago now, um, you know, I had a little girl and you start having just regular parent feel like fears. Mm-hmm. And then when you have a, a daughter, 
there's a lot more fears in the world than I ever thought was there. Mm -hmm. That makes any sense. And so this is me dealing with and working through those fears um, that I have, that I see in the world. And if I could, you know, shed more light on some of those things and, and help people work through those things, then that's, you know, the name of the game. Because I know, like, from your description, you say, you know, the book deals with, uh, you know, human trafficking, other things like that. And then to know it's, uh, you know, partially inspired by the birth of your daughter, I mean, I can kind of get that because I, I have a daughter, too. She was born three years ago. And you start to think crazy things that you never thought before you have a kid. You know, you start to go, you know, maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to microchip my kid so I can know where she was at all <laughs> times. You know, like Apple's talking about air tags coming out and I'm already thinking, what can I sew this into in her clothes so that I always know where she is in case she's ever missing, you know, and near an iPhone, I can find her. Uh, I mean, I get that. And in a way it's, I guess it could be kind of Lovecraftian because it's a, an unknown deep darkness that you just look at everything and I, I, I'd, argue, I'd argue in 2020, especially, you know, everything is dangerous to you and your family right now. And it's just kind of, you can keep your loved ones close, but something unknown and unseen might come to get them and you won't be able to do anything about it. That is 100% the book mm -hmm. right there in a nutshell. Like I, I am so fearful of the things that I can't control, which is a very Lovecraftian mm -hmm. kind of theme. And um, on top of that, you know, I, I really, when I when I started thinking about like um, sexual abuse or human trafficking, and um, I started thinking about like there's probably so many people that I've walked by in the mall or on the street or maybe even I work with mm -hmm. um, that I have no idea, you know the you know the 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 you know the scars that they have if i'm going to use that metaphor mm -hmm. and that's you know an unseen monster that no that only they are dealing with and so i thought it was a really unique way an angle i could attack lovecraft and his themes um because lovecraft is you know i could have done like a big cthulhu monster and all that stuff and but i think it's been done over and over again and then kind of Lovecraft Country did it in a really nice, um, you know, awesome way, kind of in the mainstream for the first time in a long time. Like, we haven't, I don't think we've seen a mainstream, like, Lovecraftian That's thing in a very long, in a very long time, if at all. Maybe The Thing, back in the yeah. 80s. Um, uh, so that was, like, the biggest one. And so I knew when I had this idea that I needed to attack it from a completely different angle. And that was, I thought, not only an angle that was unique, but it was an angle that meant a lot to me. Um, and so that's, that's kind of how I, I went about it. Okay. So your characters, the Richmonds, how did they come about? So, um, I didn't want my story to be about, um, another victim. I didn't want, you know, someone who is, who they themselves dealt with, um, sexual abuse or sexual trauma or anything like that. I wanted for for my for my story you know when you when you craft a story there has to be some sort of lesson in there that the character goes through and then the audience vicariously kind of learns that lesson mm -hmm. as they go through it with someone being a victim we've seen that over and over again right the victim doesn't need to learn the lesson right who needs to learn the lesson is the person who's either doing it or the people that allow it to happen and so when I started thinking about that, I really, I really wanted to deal with someone who had all the power and the wherewithal and the, the knowledge to stop this and say something to make a difference in the world, but isn't. And so that, and then what happens when that person is faced with the reality of their situation? How do they, you know, overcome that? And, you know, if that makes one person who might be in that position, you know, is able to say something or do something then you know i've done my job so that that's kind of you know that's how i i attacked it and then um the more i thought about it you know now that i'm a father with a daughter i really you know i didn't want it to come from a male perspective i definitely wanted um a female not only with the 
type of themes that we're attacking and, and talking about. But I also um, I also wanted something that when my daughter's old enough to read this, that she could, that she could like <laughs> you know maybe maybe I don't know if identify, but at least you know there's a strong female character for her. Makes sense because I mean, it's, it's going to be a couple years down the road before she reads. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, from what you, you write in the Kickstarter, I mean, the, the main character is, you know, it's a female character with agency. You know, this is a person who potentially lives above this type of reality. This kind of thing doesn't have to affect her, doesn't typically affect her, but she's being drawn into it because of family drama. And, and now she's being forced, you know, from what it says to make a choice, whether or how she's going to handle it and deal with it. So it's... You know, it's probably something that happens more often in reality than we know, but it's also a glimpse into it because we would never know about it. You know, it would all be behind closed doors. This is that peak behind the closed doors that um, we wouldn't see. Definitely. So your creative team, I see you have your artist, you have your letter, you have your editor, all which come with some decent accolades. How did you assemble them? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so I'll start first with uh, with Isaac, the artist. Um, I was, you know, I I was looking for an artist. Um, I I had just kind of um, was starting to to put the project together, and uh, I have a bunch of buddies in the kind of comic book world. And uh, one of my good friends, uh, he's a he's an amazing writer, amazing creator. His name's Alex Breen. Um, he was looking for an artist for a project himself and one thing me and him do besides um you know we we kick ideas back and forth um he was like hey you know these are some of the artists that i'm thinking about doing this project with um what do you think about them and then one of them happened to be isaac um and i was like and he told me the you know what he was what his project was and i was like you know what the best person for this is artist a which is not isaac Right, because that's his style's perfect for this. I was like, mm-hmm. but I really like Isaac. Can I contact? <laughs> can I poach him from you? And he was like, Yeah, I was leaning towards that guy anyways. But Isaac is awesome. Um, Isaac's style wasn't the style I was originally envisioning for the book. Um, but the more work I saw of his, the more I fell in love not only with his storytelling ability because he's an amazing storyteller, going from panel to panel to page to page. Um, his level and attention to detail, like, I mean, just the graffiti on the first panel, like on page two on the, um, on the building, like that just takes so much time. And the fact that he's willing to do that in each panel. And like, if you go down, I I think if you're looking at the Kickstarter, it's page five or six, that cornfield, he drew every single piece of corn in there, man. That's wild. (laughs) That's a lot of corn. That is a lot. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, like, uh, those were some things that really stood out, but really what made him stand out to me, and you could see it on the preview pages on the Kickstarter, is his quiet moments he might do better than anyone I've ever seen. So, like, the moment where Lillian is grabbing the girl, like, mm-hmm. slowly getting close to the girl on the couch, like, just the just his way that he's able to portray that emotion, those quiet moments. In this book, it has, even though there's monsters and tentacles and there's crime and corruption and all that stuff, it's these emotional moments that the book's really about that are some of the biggest and strongest moments. And Isaac does that better than anyone. And that's what really drew me to him. Um, so I, I basically just reached out to Isaac, said, hey, here's, here's you know, my credentials. Here's what I'm thinking about doing. I'd love to work with you. And he graciously, not only was he available, but he was 100% on board with it. And uh, I couldn't be happier. Like, he, he gets the book. Like, he understands the book. He, you know, there's a page where there are, um, on the Kickstarter where they're walking out of the apartment, they're kind of like walking down the stairs and there's a panel where it's just like, uh, it looks like a Barbie doll laying on the ground. Mm-hmm. That was all him. That was not in my script. Like everyone's going to think like I wrote that, but that's like one of the most powerful images, right? Because not only does it sum up the entire kind of theme of what we're going for and it works at that, that like a visceral mm-hmm. level, you know, what's going on. Um, I didn't put that in my script. Everyone's going to think I did that, but that was all Isaac. <laughs> that was all Isaac. So 
I mean, it's it's things like that that Isaac brings to this. You know, um, he he um, he's just a, an amazing collaborator, man. He's just really really good. Um, I couldn't be happier working with him. I'm I mean, he's an amazing artist. His art's beautiful. He totally gets the noir f- feel that I'm going for. Like he understands the shadows and the tone, and I mean, I'm just blown away by by his work. I could just go on and on, talk, you know, talking about him. Um, but yeah, that's that's how I, I, I um, a, how I met Isaac. And a quick thing, uh, this book is going to be all black and white. I'm guessing, right? All black and white with some splashes of color. So like, if you, yeah. So if you see like on, um, yeah. So like you'll you'll see those. Um, and then the blood on the deer and it's just, we're just going to do it sparingly, but mostly it's black and white. We really want to get that noir feel. Cause that was the next thing I was going to bring up. Cause you know, you, you don't have listed a, a, an anchor. So I'm assuming he's doing the, the pencils and the inks too. And yeah, it's just, you know, it feels very strong, even though it's black and white, like everything is super detailed. The darks are dark, the, you know, everything is, it's just very clear. Like what's being trying to, what, what he's trying to express when he's drawing it between the use of light and shadow and you know just white space and dark space yeah, it's really cool just yeah for one guy to have done all that and all yeah I, damn corn that's just so much corn <laughs> yeah i uh i pre- yeah i appreciate it and i'll, I'll pass the love love uh, to him yeah he's um he's amazing he really is and he's um super professional which i love um and he's i got nothing but great things to say about him like he's amazing i, I think we're gonna you know, hopefully, one of the things that I always, you know, one of my, my, you know, goals in this is besides making a book and a great book, but, you know, hopefully my collaborators like uh, Camilo Ponce from Man of Sin, um, Donna Black, who I did um, a short story with in Nightmare Theater, which was a big anthology that just uh, got successfully kickstarted. We had a short story in that. Uh, and, or Isaac here. Hopefully someone sees their work and wants to work with them whether it's another indie creator or bigger name, like that's, you know, that's a huge, you know, goal of mine for these guys. Um, which is, you know, which I hope it happens and, and they deserve to because they're amazing artists. Um, so that's how I met Isaac. And, uh, very similarly, um, my same friend, Alex Breen was working with, uh, uh, the letterer DC Hopkins. Um, I had another, I've, I've worked with another letterer before and he was amazing. Um, but it's one of those things that we worked together for five years and I just wanted to, you know, I wanted to date, you know, see what else is out there. Right. <laughs> yeah. Kind of like, uh, you know, we worked for five years. He's amazing. I, I'm definitely going to work with him again. Um, but I just, you know, sometimes you're just like, all right, I just want to yeah. fresh, fresh, you know, fresh eyes, fresh, you know, sounding board. Um, and he was working with uh, DC. My buddy Alex was working uh, with DC on a short story and he was like, hey, you know, he's available for some work if you're looking for another letterer. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll try another guy out. Like, let's see what's going on. And DC's amazing. He's like, he's been on so many books. Uh, he's been on, uh, he's been on a bunch of books that um, I think. Lots of big guys. Um, Boom, DC, IDW, Dark yeah. Horse, Image, Disney. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's, he's a, he's a, he's a pro. Um, and luckily for me, he was, he was available um, and he wanted to work, he wanted to work with me, which, which is nice. And so I worked with him, uh, on the short story that I mentioned, uh, that's in the nightmare theater. That was the first thing that we collaborated on. Um, and then when I told him about this project, he was like hundred percent on board and he bring, you know, he, his story, you know, not only is Isaac's an amazing storyteller, but so is DC, right? Like how he, how and where he puts the word balloons and how he focuses the reader's eye is really amazing. Like some of the choices that he makes um, is just second to none. Like, and just, and just like the, the captions, like before or now that style, like that's all him. Like, I'm, I'm not like, I want this style. Like he's, he's taking those storytelling choices that just make the book what it is. And so like, I couldn't be, I mean, he's amazing to work with and he's, uh, you know, he deals with all of my, like uh, my changes all the time. Like he, like, uh, if I'm like, ah, I need the dialogue to say this. I don't like the way it's sounding. Like when I'm reading it on the page, he's like super cool mm-hmm. about dealing about dealing with me. I don't do it often, but he's been cool enough to deal with me. Um, so that's why I met DC. So this is the second thing we've worked on together. And David Gallagher, um, I you know I've done editing work myself. I'm a you know um, 
my career is I'm an, I'm an English teacher. So like, I, I feel very confident in my ability to not only write, but like edit my own stuff. However, I'm an awful editor of my own stuff. <laughs> and so, um, you know, sometimes I can't see the forest through the trees. Um, cause I'm just so deep into my own story. And so I really wanted this book, you know, man of sin, my first book, um, I didn't have an editor and I think I could have, that book could have been even better. I think it's a great book. I'm super proud of that book. Um, but it could have been elevated maybe even further with someone that could rein me in and focus me in some spots. And that's kind of what David's been doing. Um, how I met David is I just put an open call out, um, uh, looking for an editor and I had some really great applicants, some like really high level people that wanted to work on this project with me. And, um, the person who stood out the most for me and I thought was the best was David. Um, basically because not only did I like the way, uh, way we worked together, like in our few conversations we had to get this started. Um, but he understood the story Mm -hmm. and he understood what I wanted to do with the story. Um, I've, I've worked with other people before and a lot of, you know, editors or managers, um, a lot of them, when they're working with someone, try to put their fingerprints on it. Yeah. Right. And David doesn't want to put his fingerprints on it at all. He just is literally just wants the best story and the best this, this thing could be. And he's really kind of focused, focused me in the story and really kind of helped me sharpen um, the spots that need to be sharpened. So like getting him on board was, you know, absolutely amazing. And the fact that he's like uh, an industry vet that's worked on Iron Man and Green Lantern. And he's the guy who writes. Yeah. He's the one who writes Call of Duty. Like he, like he's a legit pro. And the fact that he even wants to work with me has been awesome. Um, and so, and so, yeah, like if you look at the panel, I think it's the third page where Lillian is all her dialogue where she's being really kind of um, predatory Mm -hmm. towards the young girl. All that dialogue is new. And that was because that wasn't in the original script. Once I brought David on, he knew what I was trying to do, but he forced me to go like super ham. Mm. Like I I was like really subtle and like, it was, (laughs) it was more like, I don't know. It was, it wasn't that. It, it wasn't what you see on the Kickstarter yeah, page. Yeah, it's a, there's definitely a level of aggression that builds from when yeah. she shows up and starts talking to her. And like you said, it's, it's getting closer and closer to her. She's talking to her. So, yeah. yeah. And, he, he, you know, your letterer even still, like the emphasis on the words he puts on that page. You know, if you, you could imagine if it was being delivered, you know, it would just keep building and building this tension between these two people. Yeah, that was... Uh, a hundred percent what we were going for. And it was, um, it was something that David knew that's what I was going for, but I, you know, I didn't hit it where it needed to be yet. And that's what a good editor does. Like he notices that they, he or she, you know, they notice that and he noticed it right away in my script, which some of the other editors that I was, you know, working out with didn't. Um, and that really resonated with me. Um, and so I'm just super happy that he's on board and, um, you know, he's, he's definitely helped me take this to what, you know, the next level where it needs to be. That's really cool. So, I mean, everything with this sounds really cool. Um, you guys are pretty close to hitting your goal. You look like you're within about $504 with 18 days to go. So feels pretty good that you guys should make it. Um, so that's awesome. It looks like you are aiming for early next year to ship the first issue. Yeah, so um, we'll probably have the issue done and shipped before that, but I wanted to put it far enough out that if there was any problems that we, like, weren't like, hey, we can't get this done uh, in time. So, like, Isaac, he does two pages a week. So he's been working since this thing. The thing's almost um, almost done. Um, he's He got all the layouts for the rest of the issue, and he's going to start – um, producing some of the issue, some of the pages here. Um, so we should have it done by the first of the year, by the, by the, by the end of December, we should have it done and then sent to the printer. But I don't know, you know, 
I don't want to get logistic. You know, I, when things are out of my hands, I want to put it to a point where I know I can deliver in February. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, that's the goal. Get it, get it done and shipped uh, to everyone and have it, have it in everyone's hands by, uh, you know, by February. Maybe they could read it over Valentine's Day. <laughs> the perfect Valentine's Day gift for some yes. people, I'm sure. Not, not everyone, <laughs> for some. Some, this might, this would scratch their itch, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. Where do you want to go after that? Because I think this is, you said this was multiple issues. Yeah, so uh, we're going to serialize um, Forgotten Hymns on Kickstarter. I didn't take this to a publisher. Um, I didn't want to take it to a publisher. You know, um, I wanted to do this all, you know, uh, you know, do it yourself through me. Um, I've worked with publishers before. They're great. I, you know, I'll, I'll work with publishers again in the future. But I, I wanted this to be something that was special and unique and something that you could only, you know, get through Kickstarter, which I think, you know, is one reason why I like Kickstarter, right? We're, we're giving people things that you couldn't get normally, you know, through the direct market. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're 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 going to serialize um, the entire series and then come out with a trade. It's going to be, you know, all through Kickstarter. Um, but what's next is I have my first four way, my first, you know, take on sci-fi. I'm working with another great artist um, who just uh, finished his campaign in Pure Blood on Kickstarter. I'm going to be working with him uh, on a sci-fi story. Probably. Um, it's going to be in between probably issues two and three of Forgotten Hymns. So while um, Forgotten Hymns two is finished up and getting ready to ship, we're probably going to um, you know release. Um, me and Nathan are probably going to release that series, and the series is called uh, Children of the State. And basically, what Children of the State is, um, it's a kind of dystopian future in the way of like. Uh, a brave new world where everything is perfect. Mm-hmm. But the only thing is, is that, uh, you have to have a government license to have children. And so the, um, the, that makes DCFS the most powerful agency <laughs> in the United States. And they, you know, and we're going to follow some DCFS agents as they, uh, look for, you know, children crime, if you will, about pregnancies. Um, and so what it kind of turns, it turns, you know, there's a lot of really fun things we're going to do with that series. Like, um, it, you know, there's a, uh, a class thing and, uh, and an economic socioeconomics thing that like the only way you could get this license to have children is you have to have the means. And so, um, that creates a whole kind of subsect of a black market for children yeah, in a different, a, 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 kids. yeah. Um, and, you know, when me and Nathan, when I was pitching this idea to Nathan and we were just talking about it, um, you know, he was like, yeah. And the first image I see is like, you know, if only the rich have kids, people are going to want those kids. If you can't, right, like people are going to want to have a family. So you're going to have to hire some sort of, you know, security. And he was like, I just see nannies with machine guns. I was like, that's the greatest image <laughs> that's I've fantastic. ever seen. Yeah. So uh, Children's State, that's going to be our... Um, my my sci-fi series um it's a, a near future future-ish future adjacent um so that'd be a lot of fun so that's that's the next thing after or in between forgotten hymns sure. and then i may have i may have one or two things up my sleeve here or there but it's way too early to, to you know say anything all right well that's definitely something to look forward to and just so we can say real fast, Forgotten Hymns has 18 days to go, so there's plenty of time. But before we wrap up, just want to know a little about you as a person, as a as a whole. What, what started you as a writer? Yeah. Oh, man, uh, that's a great question. Uh, I was always writing uh, different things and being creative as a, as a young kid. Like, I remember, like, uh, making my own Beanie Babies, like drawing them out and writing poems because I was big in the Beanie Babies when I was like seven or six. I'd like, oh, there's not a starfish Beanie Baby. Let me <laughs> draw a starfish on this piece of paper and like color it and then make my poem. And I remember like g- compiling like a whole list of them and then begging my mom to send them to, you know, Ty, Ty Warner or <laughs> Ty, whatever the company was, because, you know, they they had to see that they were awesome. Oh, you yeah, know, so I think they're awesome. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, you know, I did that. Another thing I did was it was, you know, 
back when the big like yellow phone books were a thing. Oh yeah. And and uh so I remember being like seven or eight. I was young, maybe ten at the most. Um I remember getting the yellow phone book, flipping through it, finding Sega of America and calling Sega of America <laughs> and then the the first person who answered the phone, I just started pitching this game idea. <laughs> And, like, I don't even remember the game. I just remember doing this. And it was a very nice secretary. And they listened to me, this, like, 10-year-old, like, talk for, like, 20 minutes. They're very kind. They're like, let me send you over to, like, uh, like R&D or whatever. Yeah. And then she transferred me over there. And, like, I remember just sweating, like, oh, my God, they're going to make my game. They love it. <laughs> <laughs> and they, uh, you know, R&D answers were like, ah, whatever. And it was a completely different tone. It was like... <laughs> They're like, well, what, what's going on? I was like, oh, my name's Andy. Blah, 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 blah. And I started like, and as I'm going through, he's like, he's like, stop, 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 stop. He's like, do you have a demo? And I'm 10. I'm like, what the fuck's a demo? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, uh, no. And he was like, all right, once you have a demo, send it to us. And hung up. And I was like, no. What's and a demo? So, I got to find a demo. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea what a demo was. Uh, so I did that. I actually did the same thing to uh, Nintendo. <laughs> uh, they didn't pick up, though. No, um, I mean, you, know, you just have to call up and be like, I'm looking for Mario's father. Yes, yes. Uh, so that was like, it, it was always been kind of something I like to do. Um, and so when I, you know, I, I went to, to college for creative writing. Um, so I, I was in kind of that realm anyways. I kind of studied that for a really long time. Mm-hmm. And then when I got out of college, I decided I wanted to be a teacher. So um I, I started, you know, down that path, um, and I was always working with, you know, stories and all of that stuff. And then, really, what happened? Um, this is kind of a, a really kind of full circle moment. Um, I was at I was at C two E two years ago, maybe seven eight years ago, maybe longer. I, I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> and it was the first C two E two I was ever at, and I was getting copies of um, the comic Fell from Warren Ellis and Ben Templesmith. Mm-hmm. I, had, I had the whole series. And um, Ben Templesmith was signing at C2E2. And he was very gracious. I walked over with like 12 comics or something crazy like that. And he was like, mm-hmm. and I didn't know like that's like not a, like my, I was like my first convention <laughs> or whatever. I didn't know like that's kind of rude because there's a huge line, but whatever. Yeah. So he's, he's signing these things and we're chatting. And I said, you know, I'm really thinking about, you know, writing my own story you know do you have any advice for someone who's never done it and then he was very graciously he said you know don't wait for permission like you don't need permission to make your story go out and make your story find an artist like do the thing that you want to do the last thing you should do is ask for permission you're good enough you know as you are like you'll get better you'll stumble you'll make mistakes but you are good enough don't wait and that just like catalyze like that's interaction he probably i know for a fact he has no idea about that yeah. right and that i went home and then i started writing Manison, and then you know five years later it's out into the world now i'm on to you know i've done a couple short stories and now i'm on to forgotten hymns and to bring this all full, full circle i actually got ben temple smith to do the variant cover nice. for forgotten hymns and so i reached back out to him he was very gracious. He was um, uh, an awesome guy. He was available. And, uh, you know, that was my w- my one goal. So I always wanted a Ben Templesmith cover. And not only did he help me get into comics, but he's a part of a project that I'm working on now. That's great. That's fantastic. Now, I don't know if this is a... I don't think it's a controversial statement, but I know a lot of people feel like mainstream comic books are, I don't know, outdated. They don't take risks they don't do certain things anymore i feel like i hear it a lot um on the internet you know just general complaints about mainstream comics and i guess my my only question is do people need to care about that anymore with things like kickstarter and negogo and patreon you know all these outlets where you can you know have an idea for a creator own book like you do uh pitch it to people find an audience and find a way to get it made is it is it still necessary to have that mainstream when you can just you know, appeal to your audience directly now, make your book, 
sell it to them and then move on to your next project like you're doing. Uh, what do you, how do you think about that? How do you feel? Yeah. I, I don't think you need a publisher anymore. Like the, the barriers to get your idea out into the world has been the lowest it's ever been. Mm -hmm. But with that, you have to understand that it's, that doesn't mean it's easy. It's quite the opposite, right? It's incredibly difficult. Like, I'm a writer, and that's what I like to do. There are things that I hate doing and that I feel that I'm not good at, but I have to do to make my book successful. And, you know, whether it's marketing or, like, learning how to, like, do, like, really basic code, which I'm, like, not even <laughs> remotely equipped to do, but, like, you have to figure that out if you want a website for people to go see and, like, figuring out, like, what the heck is a landing page? Like, I don't know what that is. I, like, I feel like I'm a 10-year-old kid again. Like, what's a demo? I have no idea. Like, someone's like, yeah, you need a landing page to get, like, a newsletter. I was like, what's a newsletter? And I was like, it's like, it's things like that, right? Like, and then, you know, from the creative side, right? It's like, oh, I just want to be a writer. And you could send it out off to, you know, the artist and then they give you the page back. Now what do you do with it? How do you get it print ready? How do you talk to printers? How do you negotiate? Like, uh, what about shipping? Like all of these things you, when you're an indie creator and you're not working with a publisher, mm -hmm. you have to wear all of these different hats. And now it has become awesome because now I have all of these different skills. None of them are great. Like I'm not like a plus at any of them, but I'm serviceable at all of them now um which is really cool um much to my wife's dismay that i'm always like <laughs> doing stuff uh she was like what are you buying off amazon i was like i don't ask you about your amazon purchases <laughs> don't ask about mine uh but uh you know it's i don't think you need a big publisher anymore mm -hmm. now that doesn't you know um the way i look at it is you you could create an audience and and find people that enjoy your work and that will you know and then you can make your work your work that you want to make and give it to the people you know the audience that you find and you help you know curate there's also something to be said with playing with other toys like toys from another you know toy box that aren't yours and i think that's you know for a lot of people some some people that's the goal for other people, that might be a nice little side quest. Mm -hmm. um, it really depends on the type of career you want. Um, I, w I would never, you know, tell someone they shouldn't ever go have aspirations to work at DC or Marvel or Dark Horse or whatever that may be. Um, for, for some people, that's what they want. That's what they're doing this for. And I think that's great. For other people, all they want to do is make their own, create their own stuff. And for them... That's great. I just think now in today's world, you could almost do it all and do what is working for you in your career. And for me right now, I'm just focused on my own books and, you know, how I could make them the best that they can be, how I could become the best writer and publisher and all that stuff, connect with fans. You know, I, I love talking to fans. I love, to, you know, fielding questions. I love all of that stuff um, that I don't know if you're able to do if you're working at like a big publisher. Um, you know, it's much harder. Um, I love doing that stuff. Um, but if like, would I say no if DC came knocking and I was like, well, we want you to write Constantine. Am I going to say no? <laughs> of course not. All right. I've, I, I'd obviously say yes, but I'm not aiming for that right now, maybe someday. But, you know, that's I think it's the I think the comic books space is in a really good place that if all you want is Marvel and DC as a consumer, you could get that. But it's also this is probably the best time for indie books, not only, you know, on the small scale level like myself and some of the Kickstarters, but even on the larger scale, like you have Vault Comics and Aftershock Comics and Lions Dynamite. And yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's and if you want you you want to go down that path, that's cool too. And so I think, you know, do some people think that superhero books are stale? Sure, but there's a ton of other stuff you could go look at now too. 
Yeah, I just, uh, I, I hear that argument sometimes and I'm always just a little confused by it because it feels like, you know, I understand those are on the shelves in the store, but I, there's a thousand ways to get a th- uh, millions of other books out there. So it just, it kind of feels almost passe to complain about it anymore. There's just too much content for any one person to ever really uh, consume at this point. But with I that agree. said, uh, so I guess you might have answered my question. If you could play with anybody else's toy box, which one would you play with? I'm guessing uh, the team is up, up there high on the list. Yeah, um, I would say... All right, so here's my top five. Can I give you top five? Top five. Not, not in any order, just okay. top five. Uh, Blade. Yep, Blade would be cool. Spawn. Spawn, okay. Uh, Hellblazer, Constantine, however you want to slice that one. Um, Doom Patrol. Oh, interesting. And then the last one would probably be, you know, I I would really like, if I was ever given the chance, I would really like to do, um, I don't know. I want to say like Justice League Dark, but I feel like that's still in like the Constantine realm. Yeah. It would be uh, kinda, uh, it's, it's, so, it's a bit of halfway between, you know, mainstream and you know, halfway between Constantine. You know what? I, I'll go with something way, you know, way off the. I, I guess the, I was going to say, you know, I'll give you a 5A and 5B. I guess the darkness. Mm-hmm. Um, I could do the darkness. And then um, really completely out there, I would like to write Gambit. Like of all things <laughs> okay. that I just listed. That's not even in the same ballpark. Yeah. Although Doom Patrol is still that one strike Gambit like I can actually see because Gambit's a cool character and anyone growing up in the nineties probably watching X Men at any point in time, you're looking at Gambit and Wolverine going, Those two are the guys. They're cool. I need a trench coat and claws. But <laughs> Doom Patrol yeah. feels to me like actually the most out there question because I outside of that series, I don't feel like I ever hear anyone talk about Doom Patrol. Like Ever. Like, DC doesn't feel like they talk about Doom Patrol. <laughs> yeah, I, I I, think, well, here's my take on Doom Patrol. Uh-huh. I think, F, did you read the Grant Morrison run? Are you familiar with the Grant Morrison run? I don't think I read it, though. Yeah. Okay, so, outside of the Grant Morrison run in the 80s, which kind of, like, helped launch his career, along with, like, Animal Man. Yeah. Um, no one has been able to do Doom Patrol any justice if you will they don't get doom patrol and what i saw when reading doom patrol grant morrison compared to like everyone after him or since him is that he realized a couple things like he wasn't just writing out their stories to write out their stories he was writing stories that like what type of villain could the justice league not like yeah handle the the villain yeah, like, it's not even handled. Like, you can't... Some of the villains and the bad guys, you, Superman just can't punch in the face. Mm-hmm. Batman can't punch in the face. Like, they're just so... This is the only group of people that could deal with this threat, right? So that's number one. And usually people see that and they're just like, well, let's just make weird stuff, mm-hmm. right? And where that's... Where that's derived from, and I know this just because of my my uh, my literary background is he talks about specific literary movements throughout history, and he personifies them in villains. And so, like, the Brotherhood of Dada, that is a surrealist movement mm-hmm. in literature. Like, the, um, the I, I'm forgetting the name of the book, but the first story arc where the guy writes a book and it comes to life, that's a, a genre of fiction that people talk. Like, he was dealing with some really meta stuff, that I don't think a lot of people have been able to handle. Usually they just make weird stuff to be weird. And and I think that's why it's not resonating with people. Makes sense. And why most people, even if you didn't understand, like you didn't get the literary connections that Grant Morrison was playing with, you, you on some visceral level, some, you know, intangible level that made more sense just than just weird to be weird. And so I would like to take it back. Because, you know, I'm, I'm trained that way, you know, as a academic, mm-hmm. I would take it back to the Grant Morrison roots. That'd be cool. I mean, there's definitely one thing I know about Grant Morrison is he's going to take you on a ride. You know, there are going to be definitely parts of it by the, you're not going to understand. But if you, you keep going and you follow through, you will get somewhere with him. 
that should hopefully make sense by the end. Yes. I uh, I just finished reading uh, Nameless. Have you ever read, read Nameless? I've heard of that one. I haven't read it yet either. Um, it is the weirdest thing I've ever read in my entire life. You could, you know, if you want to save an hour, it's just weird. And that's where I'm going to leave it at that. Check it out after this. Yeah. yeah. I definitely, I've always liked him, but I, I probably skewed more to his bigger mainstream stuff, like his Justice League run, his X-Men. And I'm trying to think what he did afterwards. That was a pretty big run, too. He did something else after. Batman? Uh, it might have been that, yeah. But yeah, yeah. His, his, his run on stuff is always... It, 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 like I said, it always takes you for a ride. You wish get there and you go, huh, okay, I get it. It all makes sense now, but oof, for the beginning, no idea where you were going, buddy. Okay. Yeah. yeah but, nope. Uh, he, he does that for sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Patrol. Cause I, I've gotten a little more into it now since that HBO max series came out. So I'll have to learn. Yeah. More. Yeah. It's his, uh, they're pretty, they're pretty faithful to that, to his run. That's that's the impression I got. They they were pretty yeah. good. It's it's definitely not norm, and it's not weird necessarily for the sake of weird. You know, they definitely have a clear idea of what they're trying to accomplish. So, it, it's definitely uh, it's fun, and it's glad that they got they got renewed again. So it's not too bad. Well, uh, Andrew, I think that is probably about as good a place as any to wrap up our talk. So if you have one last thing you want to say to anyone listening about your project, uh, anything they should know. Yeah, um, if anyone wants to. Um, follow me on, you know, Twitter or Instagram. My Twitter's uh, at Andrew Gildy. My Instagram is at a Gildy, so A G U I L D E. And if you would like to get a free copy of uh, Man of Sin issue one, you go to aguildy.com forward slash free comic uh, to get that. And um, my series, Forgotten Hymns. Um, if you're into Lovecraft and the crime. Uh, it's an awesome series. Uh, we got, what is it, 19 days, 18 days? I don't know. So I'm probably about the time 18... you hear this, you should still have roughly two weeks, if not a little bit more than two weeks to go, because this will get up pretty soon. Yeah, and, uh, you know, we have um, we have four different covers you could get. Um, we have uh, the main cover and then a noir variant cover, and then we have two kind of special um, variant covers from great ar- artists. One's uh, Ben Templesmith. Um, and the other one is uh, Luca Vassillo, probably said his name wrong, who is an amazing artist himself. Um, so if you're in the, you know, in the hardboiled crime, in the monsters, uh, you know, this series for you. Cool. All right. Well, Andrew, thanks again for talking to us and we'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for having me. Shame.